Welcome to Eyes on Books, presented by the Laguna Woods Village Video Club. Today's book is called I'll Be You by Janelle Brown. It's her fifth book. It's an intriguing twist on a mystery about a family with, that is dysfunctional. A story about identical twin girls. So let's get into it. And a fascinating book it is. Mm -hmm. It's, n there's no gore involved, <laughs> no blood. No. So let's start with that. It is a thriller, mm -hmm. a mystery, mm -hmm. and it takes us through the lives of the twins. And it starts at a very young age and it takes us through adulthood. It starts with them as children and they are discovered by a talent scout while they're on the beach with their mother. And they're discovered there when the talent scout approaches them and thinks, perfect children. I, I need them for television. And the reason she needs them is because identical twins are always used in commercials and TV shows because they can prolong the time a, a child is used in front of a camera. They can play the same role and they won't upset the laws of a child used in front of a camera. So they have a rather good life in front of the cameras. So we have our two characters, Sam and Ellie. Sam is one twin and Ellie is the other. Mm -hmm. And the problem is that not only are they identical, but they are also, they have conflicting personalities. Sam is the gregarious one. She's the one that uh, is always out there and wanted to do the filming and wanted to be in front of TV and wanted to do the acting. And Ellie was kind of the shy one that only did it to, to placate her sister um, in doing a lot of the, the filming. And the title of the book, I'll Be You, really goes down to when Sam plays Ellie but doesn't let anybody know it. The only one that knows it is the um, makeup artist on the TV set. So, that, so they could continue doing what they were, what Sam loved to do, but didn't tell anybody. So she was actually violating um, film laws, but nobody knew it because they were identical. So Sam was the, the gregarious one, and, but Ellie, is the one that goes off and gets, um, I'm gonna say entangled in a cult-like, cult-like, can't say that? Well, no, you can say that, but we're skipping a big part of the book. Well, go ahead. Okay, so while they're still young and they finish one TV series, this is where their personalities take off. And finally, Ellie, who is the quiet, subdued personality, she says to Sam, finally, um, I don't want to do this anymore. I, I just don't want to do it. And Sam says to her, please, please, please. This is the only way we can succeed. This is, this is our life. And now they're getting older and they're offered a show of their own. And, and they're making big bucks. And they're making very big bucks. And so Sam offers her a deal. She says, I'll play both parts. I'll do both and you just sit back and enjoy. So at least, all right, she succumbs to the deal. And she figures, okay, we'll do that. But Sam's getting very tired. 
And the makeup person finally says to Sam, who knows the difference, she starts offering her jugs and helping Sam with the energy level. So Sam is succumbing to the drugs. So she could have enough energy and could have enough focus and, and could drive through the, the struggles of, of doing everything. And Ellie sees this happening and she sees her sister heading towards a crash and she can't stop it. And Ellie, meanwhile, is going, no more, no more. I don't want to renew this contract. So she wants to go home. Their mother is with them in Hollywood. She wants to go home and be with her dad, be with her mother. And Sam is going, no, you can't do this to me. But Ellie finally gets strong enough to say, I'm going home. And then she breaks up the duo. So Sam decides she's staying in Hollywood, and Ellie goes home. So then the spiral and the disconnect happens. And so that's where Ellie starts going off and getting caught up in this cult-like, life-enriching program, supposedly. Um, but come to find out later on, it's somewhat of a scam that the director of this program um, is, is actually duping the participants out of large sums of money. And come to find out that Ellie in, in, invested, I guess, or, or put in almost $100,000 into this program, which she thought was going to make her whole and make her happy and make her better and all that sort of stuff, and really didn't realize what was going on. <clears throat> so Sam tried to get in touch with her because they always were in touch with each other throughout their lives, and almost not a day went by when they weren't in communication. But she couldn't get Ellie to call her back. Time and time again, she'd leave messages and call and text, and Ellie just wouldn't respond. So Sam started getting a little suspicious and went to mom and her mom and said, where did Ellie say she was doing and where was this? And <clears throat> started getting little pieces of the puzzle of where Ellie was and what she was doing and et cetera, et cetera. And Sam finally kind of pulled it all together. But meanwhile, <laughs> meanwhile, because of Sam's addiction, she needed money. Yeah. She Ellie spent would. all of her savings. And Ellie was her savior. Yeah, Ellie would pay for things and pay for recovery sessions and, and yes. get her out of trouble. Yeah, I mean, big money big to money. get her out of trouble. Yeah. yeah. And part of her addiction, Sam's addiction, was that she sold her eggs. To try to raise money. Yes. And because she sold her eggs, she had children out there. She toured the donors. And uh, Ellie didn't know about this. But this is where all the mysteries began. <laughs> <laughs> so she was a very <coughs> fertile young lady. And Ellie wanted to have a child and couldn't. Yet she proved to be very infertile. And Sam, even being the good sister and looking identical to her sister, even tried to seduce Ellie's husband to have a baby for Ellie. But that didn't work. Ellie caught them. Yeah and threw her out. And threw her sister out. And they didn't speak for a whole year. And then her uh, husband left. So Ellie was very vulnerable. Yes. So incredibly vulnerable. There is a baby in there. So Sam had a, a draw to go rescue 
Yeah, but before that, Ellie had the baby, okay. and then Ellie went into the cult. So who was taking care of the we baby? Have, we have to get this wrapped up real yeah. quick. Okay, so, so Ellie had her mom and dad take care of the baby. Well, they were getting to the point where this was a big, big drain on them, so they asked Sam to come up and help take care of the baby. Okay. And that's when all of this starts. And it all starts mushrooming. And um, so what happens from there? I guess the readers are going to have to. Oh, we can't give it away. We can't it's give it away. It's too good. It's, it it's is. Good. It was an excellent, excellent read with this book. Yes. And I strongly, strongly recommend it. I do too. Okay. Well, here we go. I guess we're going to have to welcome our, our author and ask her some questions. And let's wait and see what Janelle has to say for herself. Yes. We're beginning our interview with the author of I'll Be You, Janelle Brown, and we're so excited to have her join us with Zoom. So let's get to it. Janelle. Hi. I must tell you that this book was absolutely incredible. We, Thank you. We <laughs> met and had a discussion um, before you came and joined us. And we highly recommended it to our viewers because this is filled with so much, yeah, back and forth, mystery, thriller, psychological tension <laughs> that it it kept us involved from the very beginning to the very end and we absolutely loved it yes thank you so much i'd love to hear that and i read that you wrote this book during covid i did um i started this book I had the idea for it before COVID, but I really kind of sat down and started writing it right after my last book, Pretty Things, came out, which was um, April of 2022. So we, you know, the whole world had gone into lockdown. I was stuck at home with my husband and my two elementary school aged children. Um, basically not leaving the house <laughs> for a very long time. And that's when I started really working on this book and, and writing it. Okay. Well, well Janelle, I got to tell you quickly, um, you grabbed me right out of the chute because Terry and I have two identical twin grandchildren, three years old. So identical no. twins grabbed me right out of the chute. Um, but what, what, where did you get yeah. the seed for using identical twins as the, the basis of your book? Yeah, um, you know, I've been fascinated with twins for a really long time and uh, particularly identical twins. Um, you know, the, I've just always gobbled up stories <laughs> about kids who look the same and especially ones who, you know, have played with identities. And I knew that a lot of my story when I conceived I'll Be You, which is about you know, twin sisters who are child actors and and um, spend their childhood very codependent and, and trading lives, you know, trading identities, and then oh, grow up and become just uh, kind of fall apart and go their own directions. So I really was fascinated with the idea of how um, you know, you, you struggle to figure out who you are in life. And it's always a subject that I've been interested in. And it was particularly relevant when it comes to twins, I thought, because, you know, so much of their I done it, their childhood is, is spent kind of trying to differentiate each other or trying to be the same person. And so I thought that there was a lot of material to mine there, um, especially in this setup where you have one sister who's gone and joined 
you know, a, a self-help group and the other sister who thinks that maybe something is up with her and she's trying to figure out what's gone wrong and why her life has gone this direction and her, her own life has gone the other direction. Um, I just, I thought there was so much to, to explore there and I was really, really excited to, to dig into it. So this, as I read about you, seems to be your genre of the direction you've taken in, in some of your books about dysfunctional families. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that where you feel most comfortable right now in your writing career? <laughs> I don't think I've ever written a book that doesn't have a dysfunctional family. Um, <laughs> I think they're so much more interesting to write about than functional ones. I mean, you know, all what, you know, the, every, every family has its own drama. Every family has its own psychology and the way it works. And so much of the, the struggles and the bad decisions that we make in life stem from our personal issues that stem from the way we were raised and a bad mother is so much more interesting than a than a than a good mother <laughs> ultimately to write about there's just more to write about there so i mean i'm sure one of these days i'll, I'll write about a, a very you know functional family <laughs> where everything goes right but but i really think that for me what i'm interested in writing about is when things go wrong and and that's there's there's more story there <laughs> than there is when, when everything's going right, there's not a whole lot to write about. Okay, so I have a question about the actual mother in this book. Hmm. Did she know more than she let on, or was she really that disconnected? Um, I think, I, for me, what was interesting about the mother, um, and I'll be you, is her willful blindness. She knows, she knows her daughter is is an alcoholic um, and teenager. She knows that her you know, adult, other adult daughter has joined a group that is dicey and that something is definitely not right. But her way of dealing with that is to pretend it's not happening. So even though she knows she's hoping that if she ignores it, it'll go away. You know, that's, her, that's her kind of MO in life, her modus operandi. Like that's the way she's always dealt with, with problems is if I close my eyes and I pretend I don't see it, maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe it's not really happening. Okay. So she kept herself disconnected pretty much. Yeah. It's per, it's, it's intentional disconnection. Okay. I didn't know if I was reading it wrong, but I read it right. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. And we all know that person, right? The person who pretends that everything is okay, that everything's wonderful, even when things are very clearly not okay. Yes, uh, but, I do but know they, those kind of people. If they deny it, everything will just go away. Yeah. Janelle, you, you took Ellie off to this self-help retreat, um, which really adds a whole level of intrigue in, into the, the book and, and has many jump off points. Where did the idea of that retreat come in? Or, or did, was it originally the retreat or did you have some other something that you kind of softened and brought back to a retreat? I always knew that this was where the, where the story was gonna go. Um, I have been really interested in the intersection of self-help and cults uh, for a long time. I mean, America, I mean, the world, <laughs> but America in particular has a very long history of these groups that kind of sound from the outside like they're the best thing you could possibly do. Join this group. It'll help you find happiness. It'll help you figure out who you are. It'll help you work through your issues and get rid of your toxic relationships. You'll come away feeling more powerful and more successful and have sorted out all of your emotional issues. Um, and, you know, the spectrum of, of that in America is, you know, you, everything from, um, you know, Deepak Chopra or these groups, the yoga, yoga groups uh, to the cults. On the other hand, like, you know, you can look at groups like Scientology, Nexium, um, Landmark Forum, Synanon, all these groups that have existed over the years that kind of fall on the spectrum from 
starting out seeming like there may be a good thing, but suddenly you've given them hundreds and thousands of dollars, you're isolated from your friends. With groups like, like Nexium, which was all over the news a couple of years ago when I started working on this book, you know, women were branding themselves with the initials of the founder and, and joining, doing kind of horrible illegal things um, in order to kind of prove their commitment to this organization. So I really wanted to create a, an organization like that in this book. So GenFem was inspired by groups like Nexium or um, Landmark Forum or Synanon, these groups that kind of start, look benign from the outside, but the, the longer you're in them, the more dark and twisted and awful they, they really prove to be. You did an excellent yes. job with that. Yes. You Thank really you. did because it sounded so loving from the beginning. Um, right, and that's how these groups draw you in. They sound so loving and wonderful and it's a community and people join these groups because they're vulnerable, because they're unhappy in their lives. And maybe maybe they start out as a good thing, but then they quickly go can go dark and, and twisted and very bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, Janelle, I've got a... a a, a theme question for you. Um, Sam, when she was drunk and, and had lost basically all her money because she had spent it on booze and drugs, started selling her eggs, which opens up that whole other opportunity, especially with Ellie being desperate to have a child. How closely tied together, I guess, are those two ideas or are they completely separate um well I, you know I, fertility and motherhood is obviously a theme throughout the book um ellie desperately wants to have a child um and she can't she turns out she's infertile um meanwhile sam sees her body and her her eggs as a source of income, like in her darkest moments when she's, you know, desperate for money and is plumbing the depths of her addiction, she sells everything she has and, and you know, she sees an opportunity to make, you know, some quick big cash by selling her eggs and she's not tied to being a mom. She doesn't care at that point in her life and she's not thinking about it. Um, and it's really only until Ellie starts kind of going through her fertility struggles that Sam realizes that she kind of gave away this thing or sold this thing that that her sister valued so much and wanted. And that's where, you know, their conflict really begins as as Ellie feeling like Sam has this thing that that she wants so badly and she's just thrown it away. Um, and Sam feeling incredibly guilty about that and, and wanting to help her sister and not really knowing what to do about it. Um, and of course that causes some very bad behavior on Sam's part and then also then triggers Ellie to, to join this organization to help her work through her fertility issues. So it really is that, you know, it, it all, the whole story kind of stems to this moment um, of, of realization between the two of them that one of them has something the other one wants but has given it away and she can't, she can't really share it. Um, I mean, the irony is if they hadn't fought, maybe, maybe Sam could have donated her eggs to Ellie and given her a baby that way, but you know, the, it, it's all very complicated and that's family dynamics never quite work the, way you, the easy way that they should, right? Well, that takes me off to Victoria. Um, so the, the, the child, the child, um, Charlotte, you mean uh, Charlotte, I'm sorry. It's okay. um, uh, <laughs> uh, it takes me off to the, the question that I then have, does Charlotte have their DNA because of Sam? Right. Well, that, I mean, and that is, that is the question. Um, and technically, yes, she does. I mean, if she is, if Sam and, and um, Ellie have identical DNA, which is what I, which is what twins do. I mean, not you can get very technical about the science of it, and and they don't, you know, identical twins do have some differences in their DNA. But for all intents and purposes, identical twins have the exact same DNA. So if you know Ellie 
you know, Sam has a child is going to have genes that match half of Ellie's genes. And so that's, that's the, um, that's kind of what compels Ellie along this, this very dark path to, to go take Charlotte is that she looks through her and this, this kind of internal voice is saying she, she is half you. That child is, is, if it's half Sam, it's also half you. You, you are the same. The two of you have always been the same. Um, and then of course she makes a terrible decision. So, <laughs> Janelle, I am so sorry. Our time is up. You have been absolutely incredible. Delightful, thank you. And thank you. we want your book to go out to everybody in the village. So we highly recommend buy this book. I'm talking or you're to gonna the camera. miss out. <laughs> and miss a great story. Thank you so much. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. And thank you so much for the invitation to speak to your community today. Thank you once again for joining us for another version of Eyes on Books. It's been a pleasure reviewing the book, I'll Be You, by Janelle Brown. It's always wonderful joining you, and I strongly recommend purchasing this book or getting it from your local library. It was a terrific read. We look forward to seeing you again. We thank you for tuning in to Eyes on Books. And if you have any books that you think might make an interesting discussion or authors who are good speakers, we'd love to hear your suggestions. Contact us at eyesonbooks at yahoo.com and keep watching.